In the previous screencast, we examined a general expression for Euler's second law in which we referenced an ar this arbitrary point Q. And in this expression, recall that this is good for any arbitrary point. It doesn't matter if it's fixed, it can be moving, it can be the center of mass, it can be accelerating, it can be anything that we want. And we found that if we choose wisely, that makes our, our, comp our, that makes our calculations sometimes very simple. But to use this form of Euler's second law, we now had a new term that we needed to deal with, and this is the angular momentum about this arbitrary point Q. So in this new step, we could get this by relating it to the angular momentum about the center of mass. And so as an intermediate step, starting with angular momentum about the center of mass, we could calculate the angular momentum about some arbitrary point Q using this term. Now, these two equations are general. We can use these for any point that we desire. Like I said, we can be clever about what that point is. And so now, we're going to introduce two assumptions or two restrictions to this that come out with the parallel axis theorem. And the two restrictions are this. If we choose point Q to now be fixed on a rigid body, and so here's a diagram of, point, of a rigid body, in which we have point Q that's fixed on the rigid body, and we also are only analyzing a body that's undergoing planar motion, then we find a very simple way to determine this, the angular momentum about point Q, and then this term becomes buried. We, don't, we won't need it anymore. So let's make those assumptions. Let's start by going back to our definition of, of a rigid body. Now recall that we define this as having at least three masses that are non-collinear and the distance between the masses never changes. And so that's what we see in this diagram. We see at least three masses all across this in which their distance never change. And so here we have our rigid body. And if we find the angular momentum using this multi-particle system that we're calling a rigid body, then the angular momentum is expressed in this way, where we have the cross product of the position vector of each particle with respect to the point we're interested in, so this is point Q, with the linear momentum of that particular mass, of that particular point, and we add them all up, and that gives us the angular momentum of all those masses about point Q. And we just now stated that we used this formula before that relates the angular momentum about an arbitrary point Q to the angular momentum about G with this term, and so both of these expressions are good for any multi-particle system. So we haven't applied our assumptions or our restrictions to this yet. So this, this, these two expressions will even work for three-dimensional systems. So let's set this term equal to this term because it's both angular momentum about Q. And now let's apply our first restriction, which is that point Q is on the rigid body. And if point Q is on the rigid body, then we know that our position vector of i with respect to q and also q with respect to g are going to be constant or constant length. And so that means the, the relative velocity between them will be zero. So what we can do is we can rewrite our expressions for our velocity as observed in the inertial reference frame using the transport equation. And so the first is the velocity of i with respect to q in the inertial reference frame, which is on the left-hand side of the equation. It's the time derivative of the position vector in the B frame plus the angular velocity of B as observed in I cross with R I with respect to Q. And then we have a similar expression of Q with respect to G, which shows up on the right-hand side. And so because of our assumption that Q is on the rigid body, then our time derivatives of these position vectors as observed on, in the rigid body are zero. And so we replace our these terms with these cross products of omega cross r. And so now with our expression that has the cross products replaced for our inertial velocities, we can apply our second restriction, and that's that the rigid body is moving in planar motion. And we do this by setting omega b as observed in the inertial reference frame as some scalar magnitude of the angular speed that only acts in the b3 direction. And the result of this is that because we have a triple cross product, 
where we have an R cross with a quantity of omega cross with R, then this is always going to give us the scalar, which is the R term squared multiplied times the scalar of the, of the angular speed, and this will always be in the B3 direction. And we've shown this before when we developed the moment of inertia. And so now we've written this out in terms of the direction that the cross product will produce, which we said is always in the B3 direction. So let's look at each of these individual terms. The first we should recognize. We've seen this before, and if we change this into a continuous integral, we have the moment of inertia about point Q, and this next term is omega B as observed in the inertial reference frame. This is equal to the angular momentum about the center of mass, which is the moment of inertia about the center of mass multiplied times omega b as observed in i. Then we carry these terms down, the mass of the entire rigid body, and the norm of q with respect to g squared. And then our last term, again, is omega b as observed in the inertial reference frame. And so if we pull out our, our omegas, of rigid body B is observed in the inertial reference frame, we get this scalar equation, which is the moment of inertia about the point Q is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass, and then it's plus mg, and then the norm of Q with respect to g squared. And this is our parallel axis theorem, because we're stating that if we know the, the moment of inertia about the center of mass, then we can find the moment of inertia about any arbitrary point that's located on the rigid body. Remember, that was one of our assumptions, is that point Q needs to be on the rigid body simply by adding this term, which is the mass of the rigid body, multiplied by the distance, the direct distance from Q to G squared. And the second restriction or assumption that we applied here is that our rigid body B is moving only in planar motion. So meaning that the angular velocity, B as observed in I, is only acting in the B3 or the negative th B3 direction. So it, it can change signs as a result. And so this really serves two important tasks. The first, as we said, is we're able to take the moment of inertia about the center of mass and then move it to another point with those two restrictions. The other thing it allows us to do is to build composite bodies. And so we may have a shape, for instance, in which we have a rectangle, maybe we have another rectangle, and then a triangle. And then each of them has a moment of inertia about their center of mass, but we want to find the moment of inertia about this entire piece, about this point, Q, which is located on the rigid body. So we can calculate the moment of inertia about point Q for each one of these pieces, piece 1, piece 2, and piece 3, piece 3, and then add them up. And so with these two functions, in the parallel axis theorem, that opens up um, a lot of new problems for us, ways to express new geometries. And then more importantly, in the form of Euler's second law, which we have uh, started using about an arbitrary point, when using this before, we needed to go through a conversion to find the angular momentum about Q. And now we can write the angular momentum about Q, as observed in the inertial reference frame, simply as I about Q, so the moment of inertia about Q, multiplied by omega B as observed in I. And this will work every time as long as we know the moment of inertia about Q. One last note about moment of inertia is that when we look up moment of inertia for simple shapes, we'll look in the back of the book, appendix D and Cast and Paley or whatever table that we're looking in, it's oftentimes expressed as a radius of gyration. And the radius of gyration is a scaled version of the moment of inertia. So the radius of gyration would be k, and this is equal to the square root of the moment of inertia divided by the mass of that body. And this simply allows us to express the moment of inertia in a very compact term. The radius of gyration is going to have units of length, so a single length, whereas moment of inertia has units of length squared multiplied by the mass, so we're dividing by the mass and then taking the square root of that to get rid of the squared.
Now it also has a parallel axis theorem in which we have the radius of gyration about point Q and it needs to be squared and so if we know the radius of gyration about the center of mass then we simply add to that the distance between those two points which is R of Q with respect to G squared. And this parallel axis theorem is we simply get that by inserting the radius of gyration into the parallel axis theorem that we calculated for the moment of inertia.